Welcome to the briefing on Runway Condition Assessment. In this section, we'll discuss how airport operators assess runway conditions and how airport operators using TALPA's new Runway Condition Assessment Matrix report these runway conditions to the FAA and to airport users. We'll also look at how FAA's new Notice to Airmen system generates the runway condition codes that are a new component of a field condition notum. Finally, we'll explore tools that the airport operator uses to monitor conditions at the airport during the runway assessment process and why they may need to upgrade or downgrade the assigned runway condition code based on observed conditions. Airports that hold an FAA operating certificate issued under Part 139 and those airports that accept federal funding are required to maintain the available airport services in a safe operating condition at all times. Airports are also required to furnish prompt notification when areas normally available are less than satisfactorily cleared for safe operations. To help accomplish this objective, these airports are expected to have a snow and ice control plan that seeks to maintain the runway and the surrounding taxiways in a condition no worse than wet. In other words, a surface with no contaminant accumulation. During active weather events, airports are expected to monitor the runway's condition and report this information to the airport user in a timely manner. Any condition that may affect the safe operation of aircraft must be communicated as soon as possible. Whenever a runway is contaminated by ice, snow, slush, or water, the airport's operator is responsible for reporting current runway surface conditions to the user. As we'll see later in this briefing, the FAA has deployed a new tool to help airports report these conditions and through which field condition reports are generated for dissemination in NOTAMs. In the past, the way we've assessed runway conditions and their effects on airplane stopping performance depended in large part on braking action reports furnished by pilots. Braking action reports are widely accepted by pilots, but these reports may vary significantly, even when they're provided on the same contaminated runway conditions at roughly the same time. These reports are often subjective, depending greatly on the experience of the pilot or flight crew and the type of plane they're flying. Braking action reports are valuable on the portion of the runway where braking actually occurs. However, these reports are less useful in assessing stopping performance on portions of the runway where the pilot didn't apply the brakes. The report also depends on how much braking a particular pilot thinks is required, which may not be the same as what a different pilot in a different plane may experience. In the past, some airport operators literally jumped in a ground vehicle, drove out on the ramp or the runway, hit the brakes, and then made a report to incoming flight crews. While that might be useful in a very general way and might help identify trends in changing conditions, there's no direct correlation between what happens when you apply the brakes in a car or truck and what happens when a pilot applies braking action upon landing. Airport operators often use FAA-approved friction measuring devices to help determine the effects of treatments applied to the runway to improve its condition. These treatments might involve the application of de-icing chemicals or sand to the runway. These devices are useful in assessing the trend of a runway's friction following these treatments. However, airport operators shouldn't attempt to correlate friction readings obtained from these devices known as mu values to estimate braking performance described by pilot braking action terms like good, medium, poor, or nil. The FAA has found there's no acceptable correlation between the mu value and these terms. Some manufacturers of the approved friction measuring equipment have furnished data that tries to correlate braking action to mu values, but these correlations are not acceptable to the FAA. To ensure the friction measurement readings are accurate, qualified airport personnel should only use FAA-approved equipment and should follow the manufacturer's instructions for its use. For pilots, because there's no direct relationship between friction readings and pilot braking action, these runway friction mu-value reports have been replaced by the runway condition code in FAA field condition notums. As we'll see in a later briefing, these new runway condition codes are intended to be used with new landing distance data designed for use on a wet or contaminated runway based on the reported code. In the past, 
airports and pilots relied heavily on runway friction measurement readings along with vehicle and airport braking action reports to gauge the relative slipperiness of a runway and anticipated airplane stopping performance. But these methods for predicting airplane stopping performance have been found to be inadequate. Furthermore, not only have these methods not prevented accidents, they may have contributed to runway excursion incidents in the past. A major contributing factor is a contaminated runway that's more slippery than the pilot expected it to be. The reasons for this vary, but they're largely due to reported estimates not being timely or accurate, or the methods used don't directly correlate to airplane stopping performance. As a result, runway excursions are the leading cause of airplane accidents around the world. The severity of these accidents varies from minor damage to significant equipment loss and fatalities. As a result of these past accidents and incidents, it became pretty clear to both industry and the FAA that the ability to communicate actual runway conditions to pilots in real time and in terms that directly relate to expected aircraft performance is critical. Without accurate real-time information, pilots just can't safely assess airplane performance for takeoff or landing when the runway is in a condition other than dry. Beginning in 2007, the FAA, with help from airport operators, airlines, the general aviation community, pilots and manufacturers, tried to find ways to improve the runway condition assessment and reporting process. At the core of these recommendations is the Runway Condition Assessment Matrix, or RCAM for short. The RCAM serves as the basis by which an airport operator can assess runway conditions. It's also used for interpreting the runway conditions reported by pilots through braking action reports. This matrix is based on airplane performance data supplied by airplane manufacturers for each of the contaminant types and depths that have been known to affect stopping performance. The purpose of RCAM is to replace the subjective judgments of runway conditions used in the past with objective assessments that are tied directly to contaminants that have been determined by airplane manufacturers to cause specific changes in airplane braking performance. Further, the terminology used in runway condition reporting will be the same that pilots see when referring to the takeoff and landing performance data furnished for their use when the runway is wet or contaminated. There are actually two versions of the RCAM. One version is for use by airport operators. It has additional information on runway friction measurement values that might be used in conjunction with observed runway contaminants and braking action reports furnished by pilots to upgrade or downgrade the reported runway condition code. Aircraft operators have specific guidance in the FAA's Winter Safety and Operations Advisory Circular for using friction measurement readings and pilot braking action reports when formulating a decision to upgrade or downgrade a runway's condition. There's also a pilot's version of the RCAM. It's very important pilots understand that the RCAM is not a decision-making tool. Instead, the RCAM serves as a decision support tool with the exception of a nil runway condition, which should result in the airport closing the effective runway, the RCAM does not restrict operations to a runway. Instead, it should be used by the pilot in conjunction with the takeoff and landing performance data in making a well-reasoned risk-based assessment of whether it's safe to land under the reported runway conditions. Because of their differing needs and uses, it's important the pilot and flight crew use their version of the RCAM, and likewise, airport operators should use their version of the RCAM. Because this briefing focuses on airport operators and their runway assessment process, we'll use the airport's version of the RCAM for the remainder of this briefing. In a later briefing, we'll discuss the pilot's RCAM and how it's used during takeoff planning and the time of arrival landing performance assessment. During the next few minutes, we're going to examine how the airport operator uses the RCAM when conducting a runway assessment. Since October 2016, all airport operators holding an operating certificate issued under 14 CFR Part 139 along with all federally obligated airports, must use the runway condition assessment matrix to assess runway conditions. And they must report these observed conditions using the FAA's federal NOTAM system.
airport operators are responsible for conducting runway assessments. To do so, they'll continue to use the same basic practices they've used in the past for making this assessment. What's changed is how the observed runway conditions are communicated to the FAA and eventually to airport users. The first step in this assessment process is determining how much of the runway is covered with any type of dampness or contamination. The airport operator assesses whether the runway is wet or contaminated with an overall coverage greater than 25%. If the answer is no, the airport operator simply reports the percentage of coverage within each third of the runway, the type of contaminant, along with its depth, using the FAA's NOTAM system, and no runway condition code is assigned. However, if the airport operator determines that overall coverage is more than 25%, then a runway condition code needs to be assigned to each third of the runway. The FAA's NOTAM system will assign a runway condition code for each third based on the reported contaminant type and its depth. A runway condition code alert is generated to tell pilots and airplane operators that the runway is no longer dry and that takeoff or landing performance is likely to be impacted by runway conditions. If the runway hasn't been cleared edge to edge, then the coverage assessment is made only on the cleared portion of the runway. For example, if after a major snowstorm only the center 100 feet of a 200 foot wide runway is cleared, then the coverage assessment is based only on that 100 foot wide portion of the runway. It's important pilots understand that the runway is assessed according to its overall length and that the runway's thirds are evenly divided based on that overall length. On runways with displaced thresholds, a portion of the runway's first third will include the displaced threshold distance. On runways with extremely large displaced thresholds, for example, New York Kennedy, runway 31 left, the actual landing portion of the runway may be located in the middle third. Pilots need to consider the location of the displaced threshold in relation to the runway thirds and make sure they base their performance calculations on the applicable third or thirds of the runway. Once airport operators assess the condition of the runway, they use the runway condition assessment matrix to determine what runway condition code should be assigned based on the observed contaminants. This provides the airport operator an initial idea of the slipperiness of the runway. The actual runway condition code that will appear in the field condition NOTAM is assigned by the FAA's NOTAM system based on the runway conditions reported by the airport operator. The runway contaminants listed on the RCAM are known to result in specific changes in the airplane's braking performance. Further, airplane manufacturers typically furnish takeoff and landing performance data for these contaminant types. The runway conditions are categorized top to bottom with respect to the known effect on stopping performance for the listed contaminants. As one moves down the matrix, the runway becomes more slippery and stopping performance is further reduced. Notice that for some runway contaminants, for example, wet snow, dry snow, water, and slush, the depth of the contaminant influences the slipperiness of the runway. For compacted snow, the outside temperature influences the slipperiness of the runway. In both cases, the runway condition code assigned to these contaminants reflects the increased slipperiness of the runway based on the observed depth or temperature of the contaminant. As we discussed in the briefing on contaminant types, certain combinations of layered contaminants are known to increase the slipperiness of the runway and have their own runway condition codes. In the RCAM, contaminant descriptions that have similar slipperiness characteristics or known effects on airplane stopping performance are grouped together. Each grouping is assigned a runway condition code, which FAA abbreviates as RWYCC. Runway condition codes are numbered sequentially, 0 through 6. These codes serve as a standardized shorthand describing the relative slipperiness of a runway. The code 0 describes an extremely slippery runway with minimal or non-existent braking action, while the code 6 describes a runway that is dry. As we'll see later, the runway condition code can also correlate with a pilot braking action report. To increase the usefulness of these runway condition codes, the FAA encourages airplane manufacturers to develop and furnish to pilots landing distance performance data based on these codes. 
This new type of landing distance data helps the pilot estimate the amount of runway needed for landing for the current reported conditions and whether the runway length available is sufficient for a safe landing. During changing weather conditions, this data will also allow the pilot to determine the minimum runway condition code acceptable for landing. Because of their direct relationship to landing data available to pilots and to the descriptions of braking action on a runway, the runway condition codes have replaced the use of runway friction or mu values in runway condition reports. Just prior to the implementation of the TALPA initiative, the FAA granted a request from airport user groups to allow airport operators to use some measure of discretion on reporting runway wet conditions when it's the only contaminant present on the runway. The FAA still, in the interest of safety, highly encourages airports to report a runway as wet. However, they're not required to do so. The airport operator still must report when there is water on the runway at a depth greater than one-eighth of an inch, covering more than 25% of the runway. Because of the discretionary leeway granted to airports regarding reporting a runway that's wet, pilots are cautioned to use the current weather reports, airborne weather radar data, or their own observations to determine if the runway might actually be wet regardless of the current field condition report. As we talked about during the briefing on the contaminant types, the effects of mud, ash, sand, and oil on an airplane's performance have not been established by airplane manufacturers, so the runway field condition NOTAMs will report these types of contaminants. However, no runway condition code will be assigned to the runway that has mud, ash, sand, or oil present if these are the only reported contaminants. Airplane operators and pilots must use other guidance and methods to determine whether it's safe to take off or land on runways where these types of contaminants are present. Rubber accumulations, along with general wear and tear, greatly contribute to the runway's slipperiness. These deteriorations also negatively affect the performance of skid-resistant surfaces like a runway grooving system or porous friction course overlays in removing water from the runway surface. The FAA furnishes airport operators with guidance about skid-resistant airport pavement surfaces, which include minimum friction levels for the skid-resistant surface when the pavement is wet. An airport operator is required to periodically evaluate these surfaces for deterioration. If that evaluation indicates the friction level has fallen below the minimum level established by the FAA, operators must inform users and pilots of the runway's increased slipperiness when wet. The airport operator does this by issuing the field condition NOTAM, slippery when wet, through the FAA's NOTAM system. When the airport operator identifies the runway as being wet, the NOTAM system will assign a runway condition code of 3 to each third of the runway, instead of the code 5, alerting the pilot of the reduced braking effectiveness. If the runway surface is significantly slippery, the airport operator has the option to further downgrade this code to a 2 or a 1. Through extensive analysis, the RCAM is designed to closely correlate runway conditions with stopping performance, but there may have been other objective observations and measures suggesting that stopping performance could be worse than indicated by the runway condition code associated with the observed conditions. To account for this, the airport operator may elect to downgrade the runway condition code. When information obtained from friction measuring devices, pilot reports, or other observations suggest the runway conditions are worse than reflected by the matrix, the airport operator can use the downgrade assessment criteria section of the airport operator's RCAM to lower the reported runway and condition code. The correlation between runway friction measurements and runway condition codes in the RCAM are only intended to be used for upgrading or downgrading the runway condition code associated with the observed contaminants. Airport operators should use their best judgment when using friction measuring devices for downgrading assessments, including their experience with a specific measuring device being used. As we mentioned earlier, pilot braking action reports rarely apply to the full length of the runway, so these reports are limited to the specific sections of the runway surface where wheel braking is applied.
Temperatures near or slightly above freezing may cause runway contaminants to behave more slippery than indicated by the runway condition code. At these temperatures, airport operators should exercise more awareness of runway conditions and should downgrade the runway condition code if supported by pilot breaking action reports. Likewise, the runway may not be as slippery as the RCAM would seem to indicate for the observed contaminants. Because friction varies between certain contaminants, there might be circumstances when a runway that's assigned a code of 0 or 1 might not be as slippery. The airport operator can upgrade the runway condition code when the runway's friction measurement is 40 or more. That's when it's supported by sound judgment and breaking action reports. But an airport operator is not permitted to upgrade a runway condition code to a value higher than 3. Once upgraded, airport operators must continually monitor the runway surface to make sure the runway surface condition does not deteriorate below the assigned code. The operator also has to consider all variables that might affect the runway surface condition, including precipitation conditions, changing temperatures, wind, the effect of runway use, and the type of aircraft using the runway. If sand or other approved runway treatments is used to satisfy the requirements for issuing higher runway condition codes, the operator has to confirm the continued effectiveness of these treatments. Since the airport operator can downgrade or upgrade the runway condition code based on the overall assessment, the runway condition code reported by ATC or in field condition notums might not match the code assigned in the pilot's RCAM for the reported runway conditions. For this reason, it's important pilots abide by the reported runway condition code instead of trying to calculate their own runway condition codes. The airport operator, who's actively monitoring the runway conditions, is in the best position to assign the appropriate runway condition code for that particular runway. Pilots shouldn't try to use the airport's version of the RCAM in reverse to determine a mu value for the reported runway conditions. Runway friction measurements don't correlate to airplane stopping performance on a contaminated runway, nor is airplane takeoff or landing performance data based on a reported runway friction measurement value. In fact, pilots shouldn't refer at all to the airport's version of the runway condition matrix. FAA has provided pilots with their own version of the matrix. We'll discuss pilot RCAMs and how to use them in a later briefing. Now that we've introduced the runway condition assessment matrix and talked about its components, let's take a look at how the airport operator accomplishes a runway assessment and how the RCAM is used to assign a runway condition code. Let's take a look at an airport experiencing an active snow event. The airport operator conducts an inspection on runway 26 and assesses the runway condition based on the guidance provided in an FAA advisory circular called Airport Field Condition Assessments and Winter Operation Safety. This guidance provides information on runway assessment practices, use of runway friction measurement devices, and other important information needed to conduct an accurate runway assessment. The inspection shows the touchdown third of the runway is 50% covered in slush, to a depth of about a quarter of an inch. An inspection further downfield shows that both the midpoint third and the rollout third of the runway are 50% covered with wet snow to a depth of a quarter inch. This information, along with the outside air temperature, is recorded in an airport assessment form provided in the FAA advisory circular for later entry into the FAA NOTAM system. Since the total runway contamination coverage is greater than 25%, the runway is considered contaminated. Referencing the observed contaminant types and their depths and referencing the airport's RCAM, the runway's touchdown zone will be assigned a runway condition code of 2, while the midpoint zone and rollout zone are each assigned a runway condition code of 3. The runway condition codes assigned to the runway will be 2, 3, and 3, identifying the code for each third of the runway. Remember, the lower the number, the more slippery the runway, and the greater the impact it'll have on stopping capabilities of each aircraft. The runway condition assessment matrix serves as a tool to help an airport operator assess a runway's condition and determine the appropriate runway condition code. However, when the airport operator submits the runway condition information through the federal NOTAM system, the runway code is automatically calculated. Using the FAA's NOTAM Manager system, the airport operator enters the assessed runway conditions. Small airport operators without access to the FAA NOTAM system can relay this information through their flight service station, 
which will then enter the runway conditions into the FAA system. The airport operator enters the observed runway conditions using drop-down boxes, each furnishing a list of standard options. Some contaminant options require a depth and, for compacted snow, require an outside air temperature. Once the observed conditions for each runway third are entered, NOTA Manager automatically assigns the applicable runway condition codes. The NOTA Manager system will also construct the appropriate field condition NOTAM based on the entered runway conditions. This will be the field condition NOTAM seen by the pilot and used by ATC to report the runway conditions and the runway condition code. Automating this process reduces the chance for introducing human error with an assignment of a runway condition code and will help in the uniform reporting of the runway conditions throughout the national airspace system. As a result, pilots now have a reliable, objective report on the runway conditions and the expected slipperiness of a runway. Furthermore, pilots can expect consistent stopping performance on runways that report the same condition codes. After NOTA Manager assigns the runway condition code, the airport operator may need to downgrade the assigned code because of what he or she sees or because of pilot braking action reports that show a more slippery condition. The RCAM downgrade assessment criteria helps airport operators make that determination. In our example, the airport operator has received two recent pilot reports from landing aircraft of poor braking action in the rollout zone. These poor braking action reports show the rollout zone is slipperier than suggested by the assigned code of 3, which is generated by the NOTA manager. On the basis of these pilot braking action reports, the airport operator can downgrade the runway condition code for the runway rollout zone from a 3 to a 1. Since FAA's NOTAM system permits airport operators to downgrade the runway condition code, this can result in an assigned code lower than would otherwise be suggested by the field condition report and the pilot's RCAM. For this reason, it's important pilots don't attempt to upgrade the reported runway condition code based on field condition NOTAMs, as the runway may be more slippery than indicated by the contaminants present. Runway condition assessment is an ongoing process, especially during an active weather event. Runway condition reports have to be updated any time a change to the runway surface condition occurs. Changes occurring during active weather events, the application of chemicals or sand or plowing or sweeping operations on the runway are just some of the events that warrant issuing an updated condition report. As a matter of good practice, airport operators normally take every reasonable action to improve the runway's braking action. When the runway can't be improved through these treatments, the airport operator should continuously monitor the runway to make sure braking action doesn't deteriorate to the nil level. The airport operator should monitor pilot braking action reports as well. When previous pilots have reported good or medium braking action, two consecutive poor reports suggest the surface conditions are deteriorating. An acceptable action would be to conduct a runway assessment before the next operation unless the airport operator has instituted its continuous monitoring procedures. If the airport operator can continuously monitor runway conditions, it's acceptable to conduct the assessment as soon as air traffic volume allows, in accordance with the airport's snow and ice control plan. The airport operator's procedure for monitoring the runway should be detailed in the snow and ice control plan. The procedure for continuous monitoring can vary from airport to airport. Acceptable procedures might include observing which exit taxiways are being used, maintaining a regular program of friction testing to identify trends in runway traction, monitoring pavement physical conditions including air and surface temperatures, contaminant types, and depths, monitoring air traffic and pilot communications for pilot reports on the portion of the runway used for braking, monitoring the weather, Increasing runway inspection frequency. Finally, FICON NOTAMs are considered temporary. Therefore, the expiration time for FICON NOTAMs must not exceed 24 hours from the effective time, except when the reported contaminant is ash, mud, oil, rubber, or sand. A nil braking action report from a pilot or a nil braking action assessment by the airport operator indicates a runway with a significant safety hazard. The previously accepted philosophy held that it was the airport operator's obligation to provide an accurate description of the surface conditions. It was then up to the pilot to decide if a surface was safe for use. The accident data 
no longer support such a philosophy. FAA now says operations on surfaces with reported nil breaking or with contaminants associated with nil breaking are inherently unsafe. FAA requires airports holding a Part 139 certificate or those that are federally obligated to close any surface with a reported nil breaking action or surface conditions associated with nil breaking prior to the next flight operation. That surface must remain closed until the airport is satisfied that nil breaking conditions no longer exist. In addition, the airport operator must coordinate with ATC to cease operations to any runway after a nil breaking report. While most airports holding a Part 139 operating certificate are continuously monitored, a lot of general aviation airports aren't monitored during the overnight hours or during certain times of the year. The FAA's chart supplement, formerly known as the Airport Facility Directory, lists the periods where the airport's conditions are not regularly monitored. Also, airport operators should use the Conditions Not Monitored Notum to advise pilots when conditions aren't being monitored at the airport, resulting from temporary circumstances, perhaps due to operation hours or staffing. When it's determined no surface condition reports will be taken for more than a 24-hour period, a single notum is issued for that entire time period. This notum, Surface Conditions Not Reported, differs from Conditions Not Monitored in that this is an aerodrome AD notum, and is issued for an extended period of time. Conditions not monitored is a field conditions FICON notum, accompanied with the most recent observation and used to report brief periods of time where conditions won't be monitored. As we come to a close, let's go over some key points of runway condition assessment. Airport operators are responsible for assessing and reporting runway conditions to airport users. The previous methods used to report runway conditions were inadequate, and may have even contributed to overrun incidents. The FAA's new Runway Condition Assessment Matrix changes that by providing a means to make an objective assessment of runway slipperiness, one that correlates the observed runway conditions to the performance data furnished for takeoff or landing on contaminated runways. The Runway Condition Assessment Matrix is used to generate a runway condition code that replaces runway friction measurement readings previously issued in field condition notums. The runway condition codes and field condition notums are automatically generated by the FAA's notum system using the runway conditions provided by the airport operator. Whenever a runway is not dry, the airport operator has to assess the runway conditions. This is an ongoing assessment process defined in the snow and ice control plan. The airport operator should continuously monitor the runway for any change in conditions that affect the safety of that runway and update the report of these conditions using FAA's NOTAM system. Should the runway conditions deteriorate to the point where braking action is minimal or non-existent, the runway has to be closed until its condition is improved. Pilots should be aware of the times when the runway conditions aren't monitored by the airport operator or when field conditions aren't reported for extended periods of time. During these times, pilots are expected to use the utmost caution and are themselves responsible for assessing runway conditions based on their own observations. And that is your TALPA Level 2 Briefing.